Okay, we have some more minutes. That will be enough for this section. One class classification. I mentioned already that we um, that we can do um, a variant of outlier detection where we assume the data is clean. And we are looking at new objects, whether they fit to what we have or they don't fit. And that's when we have the one class classification scenario. And the key method where this uh, one class is, was kind of coined is in the context of support vector machines. And the method that we are introducing now has been used in this class before in support vector clustering. It's based on SVDD, which will be on a few slides. So in novelty detection, we want to identify objects that are novel, they differ from our training data, or regular, they are similar to our training data, which is kind of a binary classification problem, except that we do not have a single example for novel objects. All the data that we have is normal. So how do we do this? Well, it turns out that density estimation is one way of doing this. We take the entire data uh, to estimate the density, kernel density estimation, and then classify objects using this. And it, we know that the support vector machines, if we use the radial basis function kernel, kind of uh, are density estimation based. And the support vectors yield an approximation, a simplified estimate of the density, which is faster, and that's why it's nice to use. But support vector machines, as everyone should know, are based on the idea of the widest road. So I have two classes of objects, and I want to put in the widest possible road in between that separates these two regions, A and B, of points. And that is like the optimum separating hyperplane. But if I only have a single class, what do I do? There is no other space where I could, um, no other point that I could put on the other side. I have like a one-sided road and infinite on the other side. There was a very odd idea at first sight, namely the point zero, that's my other class. And I'm learning the separating hyperplane that separates my data from my data origin. So in this image, the data origin is on the left-hand side out of the image. And, but you can see that this is like my support vector here. That's the closest point somewhere to the origin. This does not make a lot of sense with the linear kernel. But what if we do this in kernel space? in the infinite dimensional space used by uh, the radial basis function kernel, then the point zero is like um, an empty distribution. And I'm trying to find like the uh, uh, approximation to my data that best describes this, um, the actual distribution compared to the empty distribution. If I apply this to this data set, I get an image on the right-hand side. That is my separating hyperplane. There is some slack in here, so there's a soft margin um, version. There, uh, that is the hyperplane in my kernel space that is separating the data from like a background. And that's like enclosing my data. But it does not need to be a convex enclosing. So if I have multiple blobs, it could separate eventually. So um, that, that's the idea of the one class support vector machine, or OCSVM. So it does make sense to use this with the linear kernel. This was later on refined in a way that is usually considered to be more uh, meaningful because it loses the special notion of this point zero that exists in, in the RBF kernel. It makes it okay, but the other kernels, it doesn't. We can do what is called the support vector data description, SVDD. 
and we want to find the minimum enclosing hypersphere around some center A and with some radius R surrounding my data. The minimum enclosing ball. Minimum enclosing balls is a very uh, classic geometric problem, actually. Except that we are doing this with slack because we are in support vector machines and in kernel space where um, the geometry gets kind of difficult. So we can formalize this as an optimization problem. We want to minimize the radius, precisely the squared radius in this case. The, the factor and one and a half is just to make the equations um, more nicely later on. And I have a weight factor for the slack, and this is the tolerance for points that are outside the enclosing ball. So it's an approximate minimum enclosing ball because I allow some points to be outside. And if I would make C infinite, then I would not allow anything to be outside. Then all these, these values would need to be zero and I would need to get an exact enclosing ball. And I have some constraints that are usually obtained by um, Tucker conditions and all of this. So I have to formalize what does it mean that my points are in my ball. So the distance of the point X to the center of, the class of this ball A must be less than my radius. And I'm computing this in squared space. That's nicer. Except if there is a slack. A slack is specific to a particular point. So it may be outside, but then this value is the threshold. And these slacks are non-negative. So if the point is inside the ball, then the slack is zero. It's not negative. I don't get anything back if, I, if a point is, is easily inside. And then I can learn what you can see on the right hand side is a classic pure um, minimum enclosing ball. Um, I can learn where my data is located. Now, with a linear kernel, you would literally get this type of ball. If you go to kernel space again with an RBF kernel, the geometry gets much more interesting, of course. And then I can uh, figure out that it is. I don't need to know this point in the center. As with support vector machines. If I'm working in kernel space, which is infinite dimensional, computing this point would be a mess. But in, I, it is sufficient to know the points that are on the border of the ball or that are outside. So this is the slack that we can see in here. It's the length, how far this point is outside. And if I know the points on the ball and outside, my support vectors, that is a sufficient description of this minimum enclosing ball that I'm interested in. And now I can judge objects by their location with respect to this ball. Objects inside are normal, objects outside are outliers. To some extent, I can try to use this with dirty data because I have this slack. But to tune this parameter C, I, this is a hyperparameter I need to tune. I will need some type of labeled data, some type of other criterion. So it is really tricky to use this well in a truly unsupervised context. It makes much more sense if you have uh, clean data, you train this model, and you use the parameter to control the complexity of your approximation. And maybe say I'm accepting that 5% of my objects are outside of the ball. I'm only describing 95% of the, percent of the data um, to get a nicer and um, more robust model. This is related to density estimation, still very closely related to density estimation. The very same way support vector clustering is related to DB scan and similar clustering methods. There is the, to learn this, well, these slides are also from a class where I 
really discuss training of support vector machines with sequential minimum optimization. We use the usual technique of doing the Lagrangian. If we do the Lagrangian, we convert our um, side constraints into parameters that we can integrate in the optimization problem, and that's these, these lambda values. We're doing this in kernel space, and that's why we have our kernel, kernels in here. The linear kernel would be the dot product of these. And again, a lot of these things simplify, and in particular, you can see that A disappears. In this Lagrange like, version, I don't actually have my center of the ball, and I don't even have the radius in here. I just learn which points are outside or on the fringe of my ball, and that's all I need to describe this. And I get the usual constraints from a support vector machine that my um, the Grangian multipliers need to be between zero and C, so, and they need to sum up to one. And then it is exactly solved as existing support vector machines. And that's the interesting part that I can reuse all I have, just encoding the problem slightly differently. If I have a linear kernel, I can easily get my center by taking the weighted average of the points on the outside. So I'm omitting the, the full derivation in here, but it is the usual technique of taking the derivative of the likelihood and setting it to zero. Okay, that is it for today. I still have a lot of slides for, for Thursday. <laughs>